evening, everyone, and uh, thank you. Thank you for, uh, it actually felt good. I hadn't heard my introduction in a long time, such a good one. So uh, that felt nice. Uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, the outset, let me thank uh, Banshi, my close friend, and the entire DiacareCon team for this wonderful Congress uh, and inviting me here. Uh, before I came in here this morning, I was a little apprehensive. I'm practically doing two conferences every weekend across the country, and we have seen the crowd dwindle everywhere for the changing trends. So it's been heartening to see um, almost packed halls and the large audience in most of the rooms, and thank you to all of you who've joined in for this session. My apologies, as I was in another session, and, and uh, Dr. Shashir had to take the first session, but we go a step uh, back and talk about glycemic management and cardiorenal approach, where are we? This is, uh, the disclosure for this is there is a contract for this conversation with AstraZeneca. Now, while glucose control is fundamental to the management of type 2 diabetes, let's, let's understand that it does not reduce the risk of heart failure events. And when we start today talking about the cardiovascular aspect of managing diabetes, let's understand we are not trying to undermine the importance of glycemic benefit. We are very, very clear that when you're treating your patients with diabetes, glycemic control is extremely important and probably central to your scheme of things. But just glycemic reduction is not good enough. And this is important because very often we've had um, conversations with, with doctors where we've said, no, you said that this is not important. No, this, it, we are trying to bring about the importance of cardiorenal and cardiovascular approach. Glycemic control is extremely important. But glycemic control gives you certain benefits, as you have seen, through UKPDS, through DCCT, through ADVANCE, and many other trials. But here, you can see that in spite of glycemic reduction, what it does not offer you is the reduction in heart failure events. So when you look at the data from all these major trials, where you compared intensive versus conservative glycemic control, you saw the benefits in other aspects, but not in heart failure. We move to the section spoken about nephropathy. What is really happening in nephropathy? So when you look at the data again from trials which have looked at conventional control and intensive control, and I don't mean only glycemic, but all the parameters. So here you will compare two arms where you have had intensive control, be it of blood pressure, HbA1c, lipids, use of ACE inhibitors, use of aspirin, and so on. And then you look at the conventional one where the targets are far more leaner. Is intensive control better in reducing the risk of nephropathy? It surely is. But is it good enough? Probably no. So what this slide is showing us is that in the intensive control arm, you've managed to reduce the risk of diabetic nephropathy. So as compared to conventional treatment here in maroon, you are able to reduce in the intensive control arm. But what is important to remember is that there is still a lot of residual risk for nephropathy which is not taken care by just intensive control of glycemia and blood pressure and lipids and so on. We move to looking at the burden of cardiorenal disease in type 2 diabetes, and, and we will continue to elaborate that both of these, renal and cardiovascular disease, are closely interconnected with type 2 diabetes. So whether it is the altered energetics in patients with diabetes, the hypervolemia, inflammation, ischemia, sodium retention, RAS activation, all these factors do ensure the tri-directional link, if I can use that word, between diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and renal disease. You start looking at these comorbid conditions, heart failure, CKD, and type 2 diabetes, they are often comorbid. You see the prevalence of heart failure, 64 million as per the 2017 data for CKD, 843 million across the globe, and there is going to be a vicious cycle with heart failure and CKD very often with diabetes at the center of things. The global prevalence at 463 million. What's important to remember is 24% of patients with type 2 diabetes have heart failure as their first complication. For the longest time, we've been focusing on microvascular complications, retinopathy, neuropathy. But the fact is heart failure is very often the first complication that we see. And what's troubling is the fact that more than 50%, here we're talking about 58% patients of diabetes will develop some form of CKD in their life course. And that is something that we need to be aware of right from the beginning when you start seeing a patient newly detected with diabetes. Cardiorenal disease is the most frequent first comorbidity in type 2 diabetes. And you can start seeing, and these, these are patients who've been followed up who did not have any cardiorenal disease. They were cardiovascular renal disease free. But in the years to come as they've been followed up, what is happening? The first comorbidity which has been identified in this cohort 
you start seeing heart failure in 24% patients, peripheral artery disease in 10%, MI in 14, stroke in 16, and CKD in 36%. So if you put the cardiorenal disease together as a cohort, you're talking about 60% of your patients will end up with one of these as the first comorbid complication in, in, in the years to come. Let's move on to look at the glycemic efficacy of dapagliflozin. I did start off by saying that today when we talk about cardiovascular protection and renal protection, let's not forget glycemic improvement. It continues to be extremely crucial for our patients. Now you look at the data for add-on therapy with dapagliflozin, and you look at what's happening when you're adding it on to metformin, you're getting a 0.84% A1C reduction. You're adding it on to metformin and sulfonylurea, you're still getting a 0.86% reduction. You're looking in combination with a GLP-1 and, and, and metformin, and you're still seeing a reduction there for DAPA to up to the tune of 2%. You're looking at add-on to CITA and metformin, so a DPP-4 metformin, further 0.5% reduction. And you're looking at adding it on to insulin with or without other glucose-lowering therapies, and you're still getting a 0.9 or close to 1% reduction. Now, every time, Friends, learn to see this data, and you do attend a lot of conferences. Every time you're shown efficacy data, start looking at the baseline HbA1c. There is no meaning of me telling you 0.8% reduction, 1%, if the baseline is much higher. And most of these, if you'll see, the baseline is somewhere around 8%, barring one odd combination where we're looking at 9. So from 8% baseline, if you're getting a 0.8% reduction on average, that is significant. Some of these patients will have a 9% baseline, you'll see a 1.5 to 2% reduction. What about body weight? So here we're looking at data that add-on therapy with DAPA resulted in significant reductions in body weight, which is extremely important. Now this is important even for somebody with the Indian phenotype who you may consider as a lean individual. Because when you talk about body weight reduction, it's largely the visceral, the perivisceral fat reduction that we are interested in, and that's what the data is for drugs like SGLT2 inhibitors, where you're seeing reduction in this perivisceral fat. So here again, when you look at add-on to metformin, you're seeing a 2.9 kg weight reduction along with metformin and sulfonylurea, 2.7 in combination with GLP-1, 3.55 kgs, and, and along with insulin as well, 1.6. So irrespective of what combination you're using an SGLT2 inhibitor like dapagliflozin, you're seeing further reduction in body weight besides the HbA1c reduction. Some very interesting data that has been generated by Dr. Anoop Mishra's group which has spoken about dapagliflozin improving the body fat uh, patterns. And today we know that one of the pathophysiological mechanisms landing with the high numbers in type 2 diabetes is the perihepatic and peripancreatic fat. This perihepatic and peripancreatic fat is responsible for a lot of metabolic mechanisms which is landing our patients with early and more aggressive type 2 diabetes. So any drug today which is showing evidence in reduction of the peripancreatic and hepatic fat is going to be an added advantage. So in this trial, after 120 days of treatment with dapagliflozin, there was significant decrease in the mean liver fat fraction and the mean pancreatic fat fraction. So they concluded that dapagliflozin improves the body fat patterning. They saw improvements in various parameters, be it body weight, BMI, and various skin fold ratios. They saw reductions in sugar metrics, in lipids, in the HOMA IR and HOMA beta and HOMA indexes. They saw mean values of body fat, body fat in terms of percentage, the trunk regional fat. They all significantly decreased at the end of the 120-day observation period. And they also looked at the liver span, which decreased significantly at the end of this period, along with reduction in the pancreatic fat fraction, as I mentioned earlier. So let's move on and have a look at the prevention of cardiorenal outcomes. Today, we keep telling our patients that please screen. Let's do your creatine, let's do your urine albumin, let's look at your GFR, let's try and understand that. Similarly, on the cardiac front, we tell your patients that, we tell our patients, sorry, that let's, let's look at cardiograms, let's do a 2D echo, let's probably even move ahead and do a CT coronary angiography. Today, a lot of my patients and a lot of people known to me, my friends, my others, Anybody who's above 40, I have pushed all of them that I know that please go and get a CT coronary angiography done. And if you can afford to do it, please do it. You want to give a birthday gift, you want to give a Diwali gift, you want to give an anniversary gift, give one of those vouchers which is going to get you done. Is there a chance that people around us have a clinical, sub subclinical atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease? Yes. There are a lot of us out there who are going to have that problem. Today you land up with an attack 
you go to the hospital, you get an angioplasty done, and then you start taking care, there is no big deal. That is secondary prevention. Are we not aware of the risk that every individual probably living in an urban set setting has? If every individual has, a person with diabetes is far higher up there in the risk ratio. Somebody with diabetes, with hypertension, with dyslipidemia, probably smoking, it is silly if you don't think that this person is going to land up with a cardiorenal event in the years to come. So primary prevention is the way ahead. And which is where, when you talk about the cardiovascular outcome trial scenarios, the DECLARE trial is probably the most realistic in terms of to our population that we see in our clinics. How is it different? It enrolled patients, 60% patients in this trial were the ones who had only risk factors. About 40% patients were the ones who had established cardiovascular disease as compared to the other trials like empar all, which had almost 99.8% patients who had established cardiovascular disease. All of you physicians here, when you're treating your patients, do 90% of your patients have established cardiovascular disease? No. In our clinics, you will have 25 to 40% patients who will have established cardiovascular disease. The rest are all going to be with risk factors. And hence, the, the, the declared trial is so closer to reality what we see in our clinics. You look at the right side here and you look at the renal function. So what was the baseline renal function of patients included in the declared trial? It was closer to, the GFR was closer to 85.2. So it's almost close to normal. Those who had micro or macro albuminuria was about 30% as compared to that in Canvas or Empareg who had much lower GFRs or much higher percentage of patients with micro albuminuria. Essentially telling you that patients in Declare were healthier and closer to what you and me see in the clinic than the sicker population in other cardiovascular outcome trials. So you look at the the, the renal endpoints from the DECLARE trial, and it showed that dapagliflozin slowed the renal disease progression in patients with type 2 diabetes, predominantly those with predominantly preserved renal function. And you're seeing a 47% relative risk reduction in all the renal endpoints in the dapagliflozin arm as compared to the placebo arm. You also appreciate that dapagliflozin had a favorable effect on albuminuria across the baseline USER category. So whether you're looking at improvement from baseline, all the metrics of improvement from baseline, you see the DAPA arm doing better as compared to placebo. You see deterioration from the baseline, from micro to macro, from normal to micro and so on. Again, you see that the placebo arm did worse in that scenario. So irrespective of your baseline kidney function or microalbuminuria state, the patients in the DAPA arm did better. What about prevention of hospitalization for heart failure? <clears throat> So declare again enroll patients early in the disease continuum, as I said, including those without ASCVD. And this is a clear comparison between the four cardiovascular outcome trials. And you're talking about Empareg, more than 99% with established ASCVD. You're talking about Canvas, again, 66%. Vertis was pretty similar to Empareg. And it was only 40, 41% patients in the declared trial who had the established disease. Here, what was the result? You see the composite endpoint of hospitalization for heart failure and cardiovascular death. And you see reduction in the events in the DAPA arm as compared to placebo. You look at the MACE, you see again numerical reduction in the DAPA arm as compared to placebo. Might not have been statistically significant, but you see the numerical reduction in both these endpoints. What about hospitalization for heart failure? You see significant reduction in the DAPA glyphosin arm. 27% relative, uh, relative risk reduction in DAPA arm as compared to placebo, which was found to be statistically significant. What's important in this, in this data is also to see that how many of these patients really had baseline heart failure. And it is 10% patients who had some history of heart failure, 90% patients did, have, did not have any history of heart failure, and yet DAPA could prevent any such hospitalization as compared to placebo. Effects of DAPA on hospitalization, for heart failure by baseline cardiovascular disease or heart failure status, almost similar to the renal data, we see whether the patients had established CVD or risk factors, you saw improvement in the baseline cardio, in, in, in the cardiovascular disease status. And irrespective of baseline heart failure status, you saw improvement in the DAPA arm as compared to placebo. So irrespective of baseline cardiovascular disease status or heart failure status, you saw improvement in the endpoints for DAPA glyphosin as compared to placebo. And which is why today, friends, we have these recommendations which are being followed across the globe. 
the standards of Medicare, medical care in, in diabetes, in, uh, which has changed from 2020, and we are looking at the 2022 data, clearly speaks to us about that you look at lifestyle change, and then you start looking at the presence of comorbid conditions to treat your patients with diabetes. What does it say? If you have ASCVD indicators of high risk, you are going to choose a GLP-1 or an SGLT2 inhibitor. SGLT2 inhibitor with proven cardiovascular disease benefit, right? And, and I think that's extremely important. Do we generalize an SGLT2 inhibitor here? No. Even the recommendations are clear in saying only that with proven cardiovascular disease benefit. If you have heart failure as your baseline condition, it's a no-brainer anymore. You will directly consider an SGLT2 inhibitor with proven benefit in this population. Your patient has CKD. And again, let me remind you, almost 50% of your patients with diabetes around will have some form of CKD. It's just that we ignore that. You just start looking at creatine. You don't probably do a microalbumin, and you miss the stage 1 and the stage 2 CKD very often. If your patient has CKD, again, you're going to be preferably using an SGLT2 inhibitor with primary evidence of reducing CKD progression. And there will be sessions, as, as already done, which is showing data from DAPA CKD and other trials. So SGLT2 recommended independent of glycemic control in patients with CKD, heart failure, and high CV risk. You look at the ACE and ACE 2020 algorithm again, which is a beautiful algorithm. And I like it personally because it talks about CGM right in the beginning, something that I believe in strongly. But more than that, it is telling you how to go about it. It speaks about your entry A1C. So depending on the A1C, whether it's less than 7.5, 7.5 to 9, or more than 9, it tells you as a physician whether you should be going with monotherapy, dual, or triple therapy. But here again, let's move down in this recommendation. And across the segment here, you will see after monotherapy, in a lot of segments, hierarchically, they're putting up GLP-1 and SGLT2 inhibitor. GLP-1 receptor agonist, great therapies, larger advantage today lies in patients with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. You put heart failure, you put CKD, it's directly SGLT2. Even in ASCVD and cardiovascular disease, your patients who cannot tolerate or afford GLP-1, your direct choice becomes GLP, uh, SGLT2 inhibitor. Yes, we individualize, we do use DPP-4 inhibitors, we do use sulfonylureas, we do use AGIs and so on. But they go hierarchically below, and that is important. And as I hear the bell for my time, let me conclude, friends, by saying dapaglifosin reduces hyperglycemia on top of other anti-diabetic medications. So right from the glycemic efficacy aspect, a great drug to have in our armamentarium. Heart failure and CKD are the most prevalent comorbidity in our patients with type 2 diabetes. And that's something that you refer to right from the beginning. Type 2 diabetes, patients do land up with heart failure and CKD. So while you consider your drugs, oral drugs, or whatever to use for your patients, keep that comorbidity aspect in mind. SGLT2s are the only class of drugs with evidence of benefits in heart failure in patients with diabetes and CKD. Guidelines are very, very clear, and the new RSSDI guidelines that we are going to release on 8th of, of October in Chennai will also be mentioning the same, if I can just give you a, a sneaky prelude into that. SGLT2 inhibitors are the only class of drugs which have all these benefits. And finally, I would say, in the whole rush of out there, do start giving a thought also to the drug quality and the delivery of the drug and, and, and whether you want to use the innovator or other drugs. But you do give, give some thought to, to what your patient deserves in, in terms of the efficacy and side effects or the lack of side effects, which is going to be extremely important, especially when you give them this drug right in the beginning of their life with diabetes. With that, let me thank you all for having me here.